Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's episode is brought to you by ARK Silver Gold Osmium. They offer personal service and often the lowest price, period, with no minimum purchase for silver, gold, platinum, or osmium. Here's just some of the great things people had to say about ARK SGO and owner Ian Everard on this channel. Have bought from ARK, good source and price. I cannot say enough good about Ian and his company. He is the most honest individual I could find in order to buy precious metals. If you are looking to buy PMs, I recommend Ian at ARK. He is a straight shooter. I purchased a lot of silver from ARK. So visit their website at arcsgo.com. Contact Ian Everard at 307-264-9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com for all of your precious metals needs and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And today's guest is a recognized authority in global and resource investing, an author and the CEO of Adrian Day Asset Management. It's Adrian Day. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. And I must say, nice name, Jesse. Yes, yes. It's, I've been wanting to have you on the show for a while, somebody that I share a last name with. So this is excellent. Very pleased. Um, of course, I want to start with gold because the thesis seems to be playing out for gold at this point. Those who believe in gold as sound money are being validated with sustained all-time highs. It seems to continue to tick steadily higher as of this recording. Before we dive into why this is all playing out the way it is, what could go wrong here? What makes you think caution could be warranted? Because obviously, people have been speaking about gold going to all-time highs for a while now. It went there very briefly at the end of 2023. And now it appears to have a much stronger move. What is the bear case for gold at this point, if any? I think the bear case would be, to some extent, uh, there's, there's a few things. There's maybe three things here. One would be a kind of reversal of the bull case, if, if you understand what I mean. You know, and so we have to look at why has gold been going up for the last 18 months? And maybe we'll get into that a little bit more. But just superficially or, or, you know, looking at it, generally speaking, we all know that the main reason that gold has been going up for the last 18 months is the central bank buying. So if you say what could go wrong, what could go wrong is two or three individuals at, at three central banks deciding to hold off on buying more gold for a few months. So what are the confluence of factors that have brought us to the current gold price today? Obviously, you mentioned central bank buying as the key driver. Perhaps you could dive into that a little bit more for us. Um, and has global conflict at any, in any way, you know, they say when the world gets more chaotic, the gold price can tend to rise. Um, is that more of a short-term phenomenon or can that have a real lasting impact? Yeah, Um it, in, in my view, based on all the research I've done, there's no question that central bank buying has been far and away the dominant factor that's affected the price, that's driven the price of gold up over the last, let's say, 18 months. There's been some changes this month, maybe last month. We'll talk about that in a second. But overwhelmingly, central bank buying has been has been the predominant factor driving gold. And you could look at various... Uh, you know, there's other sources of gold buying um, that are well reported, but you can look at hard facts and statistics. And you look at ETFs, for example, <clears throat> as most people know, ETFs had net, gold ETFs had net outflows last year on a fairly consistent basis. But not only last year, even this year, we still have net outflows from gold ETFs. And if you look at the GLD, which is the largest of the gold ETFs, um, the first major one and the largest, and they report daily on their flows. So yesterday, we had 118,000 ounces net outflows, despite gold being up. That's 200, excuse me, $268 million went out. And not only that, it's every day this week. <laughs> We've had net outflows. It's the third straight day in a row. This year, we've lost 
over three and a half million ounces just from GLD. So I think we can say, and, and, and we look at the global ETFs on a weekly basis, and pretty much every week this year, except the beginning of March, we had net outflows. So we can say with, with a high degree, not a high degree, we can say with certainty, but it's not investors and small institutions who buy gold through ETFs who are driving the gold price. On the contrary, they're selling. What about retail buyers? You can look at um, coin sales. Now, there's no one report, but you can look at coin premiums because premiums tend to go up, of course, when there's strong demand. Premiums are down. I've talked to several coin dealers, both in the United States and in Europe, and they both tell me that up until the last two, and, and they all tell me, sorry, in both continents, they tell me but up until the last two weeks, it has been steady, consistent selling of coins, people coming to them to sell coins for various reasons. Some because they like the price and want to sell, but more often than not, frankly, because they need the money, which is a different issue and a bad sign. In the last couple of weeks, people tell me there's been some buying, but it's kind of a wash. Nobody that I talk to is reporting strong net buying of gold. So it's not the retail investor who's buying coins. Um, you can look at other things like the COMEX open interest. And that's gone up a lot in the last month. As speculators speculating on the COMEX, not buying physical gold, but it still can have a bullish impact on the price of gold, of course. And that is bullish. That is one new factor. Um, but it's certainly not enough to account for the rise in the price of gold. Um, we've seen this year, particularly since uh, the Chinese New Year, if you look at the numbers from the Shanghai Stock Exchange, we are seeing individual investors and households in China step up by buying dramatically. That's not surprising when you think that the sort of things that Chinese people typically buy to protect themselves, the banks are in trouble. They typically buy real estate. Well, real estate's in trouble. And they will buy uh, stocks. Stocks are in trouble. And they will buy gold. So I think, I think there's been a step up in defensive buying, defensive buying from Chinese buyers because of what's happening with the real estate and banking system as well as the economy in China, and they're buying gold. Um, so that's a factor. But again, that does not seem to be the whole story. <clears throat> so, so we're left with, we're left, frankly, with nothing that can be, you know, verified with hard data. But I suspect in the last month, six weeks, I suspect there's been some wealthy, families, institutions um, who are buying physical gold and taking delivery, um, OTC, over the counter, they're buying the gold, so it's not showing up on, on reports yet. Um, and they're buying it because they're concerned about, you know, basically the state of the world, if you want. You know, that's the economy as well as geopolitics. Now, we maybe can talk a bit more about that, but um, you asked about geopolitics. Yeah, geopolitical events, if you look back over 50 years, tend to have short-lived spikes. They don't, they, the moves in the price of gold tend not to be sustained. They tend to be bigger when gold's already in a, in a bull market, like 1980 with the Iran hostages. Uh, they tend to be bigger when it's an unexpected, totally unexpected development, like 9-11, as opposed to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, because gold moved up six weeks ahead of the invasion, as people speculated um, about the possibility of an invasion. But in all of those cases, frankly, in all of those cases, uh, the moves tend to be relatively short-lived. And you only have to look at Ukraine last year. As I say, gold was moving up six weeks ahead of the invasion, and then six weeks after the invasion, it was back to where it was before. And that's not an untypical pattern. Now, clearly, if you start having conflicts erupting around the world, um, we've got two major conflicts at the moment, but if you start having those erupt in different places, 
then I suspect Gold's move will be more dramatic and a little bit more sustained. But that is not what ultimately drives gold on any long-term basis. And this question just came to mind as you brought up Chinese gold buying. Do you have any insight that you could shed on the arbitrage in the, the gold price in Shanghai? Because there seems to be, I don't know if that's an opportunity that gold traders are taking advantage of. Why does that price discrepancy exist in your view? Yeah, I don't have a lot of insights in that. There's no question that that arbitrage was a stronger arbitrage, let's say, six months ago and a year ago. And there were people taking advantage of that, of course. Why not? Um, but that arbitrage in the last sort of six weeks seems to have seems to have gone away. And how does the government debt issue end for the U.S.? Do you think part of the reason for the gold price is in response to the massive deficits being run by the U.S. government? And in fact, governments around the world are pretty indebted. I mean, just looking at Japan now, the problems there continuing to face with a 250% plus debt to GDP, the yen dropping to the lowest point versus the US dollar since the 1990s. And and there, there's a lot of countries that seem to be um, under economic issues that are starting to emerge. Um, how does this whole debt issue end both of the US and worldwide? And how does it affect the gold price? Yeah, a lot, lot there. Um Yes, there's there's a lot of factors that can affect the gold price, no question, including geopolitics, as, as we mentioned. Um, the debt issue is certainly a big one. But I would put the debt issue into a into a larger category, which is just stress in the economic and financial systems. And I think that's what's driving, if I'm right, that there are wealthy institutions, you know, going to buy physical gold. Um, it's the stress in the economic and financial system that is that is driving them, I think. And reflections of that are everywhere, reflections in, in, in the high debt levels. And it's not just the absolute debt, but in the US, it's the debt service, which is getting, you know, ridiculous. And when you think that the US, um, for a while now, under, under both uh, uh, the last president and the one before, so it's not a party political, uh, failing. Um, these administrations fail to take advantage of terming out their debt when rates were so low. And the same applies to some extent in Europe. But in the US, when you had, at one point, you had quarter of a percent on treasuries, the US government should have started issuing 20 and 30 and even 50 and 100 year bonds. They'd have had to pay more, but if Argentina can issue 100-year bonds and Italy, no, no offense to those two wonderful countries, and Italy can issue 100-year bonds, surely the U.S. could have issued 100-year bonds. And if Italy can do it at 8%, I would think that the U.S. probably could have done it at 5%. Think how it would look now if the U.S. was sitting on a bunch of 100-year bonds with 5% interest instead of where they are now, they were issuing one, two, and three-year uh, bills, and all those bills are coming over renewing. And so what we're seeing in the U.S., even though the, the uh, debt service, which is now the second largest item in the U.S. budget, just servicing the debt, not paying anything off, just servicing the debt, is the second highest, is higher than defense now, and is second only to a very broad category, which is entitlements, which includes everything from Social Security and Medicare to food stamps. So it's a very, very broad category. Um, but we're seeing all those bills that were issued four or five years ago, uh, you know, the five-year bills, the three-year bills, they're all coming due. And instead of paying 1%, they're now having to reissue bills at 5%. So the situation is going to even get worse, is what, is what I'm saying. It's, it's going to continue to get worse. Um, and frankly, it's a government debt service that I think is the number one factor, the number one factor was pushing the Fed toward, will push the Fed towards lowering interest rates. But that's a different issue you didn't ask me. But that's one issue, the debt, but there's and the debt service, but there's other issues. I mean, what's happening in the commercial real estate? That's 
very, very significant. And it's not just in the US, but it's it's in Europe as well. Uh, several, uh, three large national landlords uh, have either deferred in Germany, have either deferred their interest or defaulted on their debt uh, this year. Um, in the US, you have the situation where the banks and the, ins uh, the banks that uh, loan the money to commercial real estate and the insurance companies that uh, insured it are able to, um, uh, let's say, make up their marks and, um, you know, make up the valuations and just defer the inevitable, which is not the case in, say, Germany and Japan, where a lot of the banks who loaned a lot of the banks who made this, exactly the same loans to U.S. commercial real estate as some U.S. banks have already written those down or even off in some cases, uh, much to the stress of the Japanese and German banks, where and, and those very same loans are still being written um, at cost on um, at par on the U.S. banks. So that's a problem that's going to, you know, that's a problem that we probably won't escape. Is we're going to have we're, we're going to find that uh, that's going to come to fruition soon. So there's a lot of underlying stress in the economic and financial system, I think, and people are beginning to realize that. And if the Fed and other central banks, but we're talking about the Fed because it's the largest, uh, the U.S. is the largest economy. If the Fed starts cutting rates, not because they've controlled inflation, right? not because necessarily only because we've got a recession, but they're cutting rates before inflation is controlled because they're concerned about stress in the system. That sends a very, very bad signal uh, to, to the market, but a very, very positive signal for gold. That was a long answer, I'm sorry. No, that was a perfect answer. We love long answers on this show. Um, you know, the saying is out there, of course, all fiat currencies eventually go to zero. Where are we in this current fiat currency regime since the dollar was removed from gold backing? Um, previous to that, some people have pointed to when silver was removed to the, from the monetary system is actually the first moment when things started to go in the wrong direction. I wonder what your thoughts are on where we stand today. How long can, you know, as Craig Hemke likes to say, the great Keynesian experiment, how long can it continue on for? Um, are we near the end game or or is this does this take much longer than most people think? Yeah, well, two things. Just generally, things that are inevitable tend to take a lot longer to happen than you think. Rick Rule likes to say, I'm not sure he was the first one to say it, but he likes to say just because it's inevitable doesn't mean it's imminent. And the corollary to that, the opposite, the other part of that is that they take longer to happen than you imagine. But once they get underway, they can unravel very, very quickly because everybody, you know, if everybody can see something, but they think they've got another day to live before it happens. Once it starts to unravel, everybody pounces. And we saw that very clearly, for example, with, um, you know, just before Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard, when the U.S. stood ready to, to sell gold at $35 to any foreign government who wanted it, and everybody knew it was, it was available, and everybody knew it couldn't last forever. But... You know, everybody everybody uh, went along with a charade until basically de Gaulle said the emperor has no clothes. And de Gaulle of France, I mean, Belgium had also done it, but de Gaulle said he wanted the gold back at $35 an ounce. And then when he did it, Belgium asked for their gold back. I think three other countries quickly in a row asked for their gold back. And then Nixon had to, had to close the window. So... So <clears throat> to get back to the dollar, um, yeah, the dollar is the world's reserve currency. And that's backed, obviously, by the economic, political, and military might of the U.S., just as when the British pound was the reserve currency, was backed by the, by the um, military and economic and political dominance of, of Britain, and so on before that, all the way back to, you know, Greece and Rome. So when a country when a country loses its and it's inevitable, 
that the US dollar will lose its reserve currency status at some point. That's inevitable. That's not a difficult prediction. Uh, it happens to all uh, all currencies. Now, in the case of Britain, uh, when Britain lost its reserve currency status, if you'll pardon me getting into the history, it was obvious to everybody, including, you know, clear thinking British people, it was obvious to everybody in the 1920s and 1930s that the US, that the United Kingdom, the Britain, was losing its dominance and that the US was taking over and was gaining in, in political, economic and military dominance. And that was clear to everybody. Now, you had the Second World War um, and, and Roosevelt, uh, that's a different issue, but Roosevelt um, extracted his pound of flesh from Britain. Um, um, uh, sorry, don't, don't misunderstand me, Americans, all you patriotic Americans. We're very thankful that America joined the war. But um, there was the land lease and things like that. So Britain at the end of the Second World War was essentially bankrupt, right, um, because of the war. And so what, what I'm trying to say is that it was obvious to everybody in 1945 but the U.S. was now the world's dominant power. And so, and because U.S. Uh, US and Britain, this is the important point, because the U.S. and Britain had sort of been on the same side and had actually fought a war together, but transfer, the transfer from Britain to the U.S. was uh, peaceful and relatively without, um, you know, uh, and... and yeah, it was peaceful. Uh, there was the Suez incident, of course, but generally speaking, it, it was it was a, a, a thing that the UK, the UK knew they had to pass on, and they knew they had to pass on to to the US. Now, in this situation, the US does not think they have to pass on, and they absolutely do not think they have to pass on to China. Now, if and they're absolutely not friends and buddies. <laughs> so the U.S. will resist passing on to China. Um, if you talk to ordinary everyday people in China, it's interesting. I'll tell you a funny story I had, if I may. Um, yes, please. Uh, several times ago, not even the last time I was in Shanghai, but I was in Shanghai and there was a, I forgot now, frankly, it was a waitress at a coffee shop, I think, and when I asked for my order, she said, oh, where are you from? Sorry, I went to the accent. And I said, <laughs> I'm from Britain. She said, these were her exact words to me. She said, oh, you used to be top dog, but not anymore. We now top dog. And I said, what about the United States? Oh, no, United States no longer top dog. We top dog. And I thought that was that was fascinating. And then we actually had a bit of a conversation. Our English was quite good. I am not trying to make fun. And we had a bit of a conversation about the dollar and the pound. And, you know, this wasn't just some ignorant person, you know, saying we're on top. So if you've got an attitude in China that they are becoming a dominant power and at some point will be the world's dominant power, and you've got a U.S. that is going to fight with everything they've got to stop that transfer of power to China, then, first of all, there's a recipe for, you know, a disaster at some point. But it also means, and I'm sorry, I'm now answering your question finally, it now means that that transfer is going to take a lot, lot longer than it did in the transfer from uh, Britain to the U.S., or before that, to transfer to uh, France, to UK, because Britain defeated Napoleon in the war. He was defeated. And so the transfer was quick and sudden. This one is going to be a lot longer. And, you know, I, I hear both sides of, you know, there's people who say, oh, you know, the bricks and the bricks and people are all bricks are already abandoning the dollar and, and things are underway. And there's other people who 
who sort of poo-hoo that. And I mean, I think the reality is both are correct. There are definitely there are definitely signs, there are signals underway, and that you can't dismiss. You know, when when Saudi Arabia says they will sell their oil to China in Juan, that's a very significant fact, and you can't just ignore it. So the majority of trade is still dollar based, yes. But the percentage of trade that is dollar based has gone down dramatically. And so there's trade and then there's assets. And if you look at the assets in, in central banks, um, 20 years ago, the dollar represented about 80% of all uh, of all uh, foreign assets in world central banks outside of the US, ignore the US. So about 80% of their non-local currency reserves were in dollars. Today, it's about 45%. Now, 45% is still very, very significant, but that's a huge decline over a matter of a quarter of a century. So, I mean, it's we're, we're moving in that direction. In my mind, there's very little question about that. We're moving in that direction. But, but we're not, it's not going to happen this year or next year. Well, I want to keep following this thread for a moment because you said some really interesting things there. And then I do want to talk about silver as well. Um, you are an expert. And on, stocks, you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you are an expert on international investing. I know that you've written a couple books on the subject. I'm wondering, so you seem to see China as kind of the next obvious global superpower. Am I correct in, in that assessment? If so, why do you think so? And what role do you see Russia playing up ahead in the, the global economy? Yeah, no, that's two interesting questions. Um, well, the Chinese economy is already on, on most, you know, if you use a purchasing power parity or what whatever basis you use, because of course, it's always difficult to compare one currency with another currency. For a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons why this is difficult. Do you use purchasing power parity? Do you use official exchange rates? Do you count the black market, etc., etc., etc.? But on most bases, most economists would say that the size of the Chinese economy today is comparable, let's say comparable to the US. And when you think of where it was 10 and 20 years ago, that's a that's a really truly dramatic shift. So if it continues, and it's still growing despite the problems in China, is still growing faster than the US is. So if if you take any kind of growth in the Chinese economy over the next 10 years, I would say that at the end of this decade, it's going to be obvious that China has a larger economy. And then you look at, you know, military, they're building their military much more rapidly than the US is. They've got for a lot of reasons, some of them tragic, but for a lot of reasons, they've got a huge surplus of young, single, adult males. And what do you do with young, single, adult males if you don't want riots in the streets? Well, you stick them in the army and navy. And that's what's happening in, in China. And then if you look at the political, uh, political power, so we've mentioned the economic, we've mentioned the military, if you look at the economic, um, political power, you know, there's no question again that China is, has done, has been doing a good job in creating alliances in various countries, in Latin America, of course, in Africa, as well as, you know, in, in, in the Asia, in the whole Asian region. So that's not to say that the U.S. has lost all of its influence in Asia. Of course not. But if you look at what China is doing in countries like Brazil, what they were doing in Argentina before Malay came along and told him he didn't want to deal with communists. I thought that was wonderful. But, um, you know, they're, 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 they're supplying a lot of capital. They're building things. You know, infrastructure, they're building infrastructure, same in Africa, building ports, building roads, building uh, 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 power plants, making loans, and, you know, becoming becoming important in that region. 
Now, but people, as we know, don't always on a one-on-one -on -one basis, there's sort of sometimes there's um, some friction in the way, different ways of doing business, cultural things. But there's no question that China's making itself indispensable to many, many countries around the world. And most of them, not coincidentally, are countries that are resource rich. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of on, on all those three factors, political, economic and military, uh, China is sort of, you know, catching up and, and potentially over uh, passing. You know, Russia is interesting. I don't pretend to be an expert on Russia. Again, there's no question they have huge resource reserves. Um, but certainly in near term, but relatively, they've got a demographic problem. Apart from other problems, they've got a demographic problem. In the relatively short term, I would say that Russia's influence is going to be in conjunction with China, through China, you know, helping China, sending some of their resources to China. Uh, that's going to be their main source of influence, I would think. But we shouldn't write to chat Russia off because they are very, very resource rich, as, as, as you know, in many things, not just oil and nickel, but oil and gas and nickel, but, you know, phosphate and fertilizers of all types and so on. Let's now pivot to silver. Give us your outlook. Obviously, silver bugs are excited as of the time of this recording. Silver's broken out to $26 in that range, which says a lot about what silver has been doing recently, which is mostly moving sideways. Um, how do you see the current setup for silver? Obviously, looking at the day-to-day -day price action isn't that meaningful. How do you see silver performing over the next few years? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and you're absolutely right, because silver's breakout has really just been the last couple of days. I will point out, though, to your silver bugs that are listening or silver bulls that are listening, silver now actually uh, has outperformed gold this year. So it's not just the last couple of days, but if you go back to December 31, silver's now outperforming um, uh, gold. And the silver stocks are now matching the gold stocks. They're virtually identical uh, year to date. Um, you know, there's a couple of things about silver. I mean, we all know that silver's more uh, as much an industrial metal today as a monetary. It still tends to move as a monetary metal. Um, but, you know, the common wisdom, which I go along with, um, it's it's common for a reason, but the common wisdom is that silver tends to have, you know, some sharper moves, but not necessarily sustained moves. And typically silver's move is, you know, towards the end of a bull market. I would like to think we're not at the end of a bull market yet. But I think what's happened with gold over the last, you know, Let's remember, only 18 months ago, or yeah, well, two years ago, gold was what, um, 1400 or something? Don't quote me on that. But, you know, it's had a dramatic move over the last two years. And so there's, so we're at the point where people are going to begin to pivot from silver to gold. I mean, from gold to silver, just because of the price differential. And I think that's what we're seeing now. But the... You know, where gold, where silver, sorry, where silver can really shine, of course, is, um, and, and we've seen this in the past, so when silver gets moving, it can move very, very dramatically as people pile on. Because everybody can buy, you know, everybody can afford $30 for an ounce of silver. Not everybody can afford 20 2300 for an ounce of, of gold. And so people can pile in, retail can pile in, and the thing tends to be very, very leveraged. I mentioned the demand side of silver, but there's another thing we need to look at with silver that's changed in the last 30 years, 40 years, not just the industrial demand being more important, but on the supply side. You know, 40 years ago, most silver produced what came from primary silver mines. Today, less than 20% of the silver in the world comes from primary silver mines. 
Some of it comes from gold silver mines, but most of it comes from base metal mines, zinc mines, lead mines, and so on. And that's critical because if you're a zinc miner in Peru or a lead miner in Bolivia, and you're producing, and 10% of your value comes from silver, if the silver price goes up or the silver price goes down, it does not affect your plans for your lead or zinc mine. And so silver, the supply of silver, tends not to respond to changes in the price of silver. That's different for gold. Of course, the, the, the response time with gold is, it, we're talking a matter of months or years, but still, if the price of gold moves up a lot, people start dusting off projects that are on the shelf saying, can we put this gold mine into production? They, they go ahead with expansions. They extend the mine life, et cetera. That doesn't happen with, sil with, with silver because it's coming from a lead mine or a zinc mine. And so that's another reason why when silver price starts to move up, you don't get any increase in the supply of silver. And there's no huge stockpiles of silver yet. Most of the silver, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, knives and forks and teapots, that was all melted down in the 70s bull run. I don't think there's, I mean, at some point, obviously, at some point, there's some people that still have silver to melt down, but not a lot, frankly. Banks don't have stockpiles of silver anymore, the way they even did in the 70s. And so the silver price can be very, very responsive and very, very leveraged for those reasons. Gold and silver miners. Obviously, a lot of people are pointing out the fact that they're very undervalued compared to the metal itself. As you mentioned, very few pure play silver miners often coming as a byproduct of other metals. But do you think there's an opportunity here? Do you think we could eventually enter a speculative mania in gold and silver stocks? Obviously, the mainstream coverage we've seen since gold has hit and sustained all-time highs has, hasn't been that much, as much as many people might have expected. Um, do you expect the mainstream talking heads to catch on eventually and that to potentially result in, in a mania in the gold and silver mining sector? Sure, sure. Well, the interesting thing is that, you know, the gold, and sil the gold and silver stocks have actually begun to get a bid, particularly in the last week. Um, and that's very, very encouraging because we could say as of the end of February, you know, which is only a month ago, we could say they actually had no bids. I mean, there was no response at all. But they, they, they began to move up well, they've moved up quite dramatically in March and, and particularly in the last in the last week. So we're beginning to see that we definitely beginning to see people moving into the gold and silver stocks, which is really not a surprise given where gold and silver are. But I'll just say, if I may, a couple of things. Um, yeah, in answer to your question, there is no, um, you know, there's no uh, mainstream um, discussion of gold and silver stocks. There's no mania at all. I mean, obviously. Um, and that's probably going to come at some point. Um, but we're, we're a long way from that now. And I think what you're going to see, what's, what, what's going to really set it off, ironically, perhaps, in some people's minds, is when the broad market starts to stumble, when the leaders when the stock market leaders have, that have driven the stock market for the last, you know, two, three, four years, um, when they start to stumble, then people will look for other things to put their money into. We're beginning to see that now. If you look at Apple's down this year, Tesla is the worst performing stock in the S&P 500 this year. So those Magnificent Seven aren't quite all so magnificent anymore. Um, but but as those stocks start to stumble and they don't have to collapse, they just have to, you know, stop going up. You start to see people want to take their profits and rotate into things that haven't moved and and or, or are cheap. And those things would include foreign markets. 
particularly emerging market stocks, and we're seeing a huge inflow into emerging market ETFs in the last couple of months. That's part of its rotation. It moves into value stocks. It moves into dividend-paying stocks. It moves into small-cap stocks. And some of it moves into oil stocks, commodity stocks, and even gold and silver stocks. So, you know, when people when people start to rotate out of the stocks that have done so well for them, they'll they'll put their money in all those different fact in all those different areas. And the thing that's because they've lagged, and the thing that's important about the gold and silver sector, we all know it's small. I don't think we all realize just quite how small it is. You know, if you look at all of the gold and silver stocks in the world, including the exploration stocks, I did a calculation because you have to add up various indexes and you have to make sure you don't duplicate and everything. But it's about $400 billion. I mean, $400 billion compared with, let me just look at, um, what should we look at? Microsoft. I won't even look at video. But look at Microsoft and its market cap is... Uh, three trillion. Well, you know, so one company is six times the size or more. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, six, seven times the size. All the gold and silver stocks in the world. But it gets worse than that. You look at Newmont, which is the largest gold mining company in the world. I'm going to take a guess at this market cap today is probably around fifty billion. Tesla trades more than that in a single day. And it gets even worse than that. NVIDIA, if you look at NVIDIA on a candlestick chart, in the last week, they've had single candles that have been over $200 billion. In other words, a 10-minute move in NVIDIA is five times the market cap of the largest gold mining stock in the world. All of that is critical because it means that when this investor and that investor decide to sell their $50,000 worth of NVIDIA, they only have to put a tiny bit of that, 1%, 2% into gold stocks for the gold stocks to move. And so that's why we're going to have a mania at some point, but we're not there yet. I mean, notwithstanding what the XAU, I'm looking at the XAU, you know, the Philadelphia Gold Stock Index. But notwithstanding what that's done in the last uh, month, and I, I, well, it's eight percent this year. I, it's it's probably thirty percent in the last month. That's just a guess. It is still lower than it was a year ago. It's lower than it was two years ago. It's lower than it was three years ago. So, so we we are. Well, we are right at the very beginning of this move. That's the thing I want to emphasize to people. And, you know, one of the things when you've been in a sector for a long time and you've had multiple full starts and you've lost a lot of money, I think we we who've been around the sector for so long, we are the ones that are most likely to sell too soon because we see the XAU up 30%. We see one of our stocks that have just sat there. It's suddenly gone up 50% and a natural inclination is to sell. So I would suggest to people to stand back and look at look at a longer term. Don't even You don't even have to go back to 2011. <laughs> just last year, the stocks were higher. You know, two years ago, they were higher. And then look at valuations and look at the valuations as of the beginning of March, it's obviously changed a bit now, but I did this at the beginning of March. As of the beginning of March, the price to free cash flow of Agnigo Eagle, the third largest gold mining company in the world, was its lowest in 40 years, which is basically its entire history, other than the last quarter of 2015. So does that make sense that when gold is hitting new highs, when despite inflation and costs, the margins are still very strong, right? Does it make sense that Agnigo, a great company with no hairs on it, is selling at its lowest price to cash flow? Barrick, the second largest gold mining company, 
selling at its lowest price to net asset value in 40 years. So these stocks are just still dirt cheap. That's the point I want to get across to people. Well, Adrian, this has been an incredible conversation. I've learned so much. For those who want to learn more, uh, could you tell us about Adrian Day Asset Management? And if there's anywhere else you want to direct people online, feel free to do that as well. Sure. Well, Adrian Day Asset Management, we're a money management firm. Uh, we can't take Canadians at the moment, although we're looking for a registration up there, but we can't take Canadians at the moment. Um, but we, we manage money in both gold and global areas for retail, for, for ordinary investors. And our accounts are all individualized. So a person can say they don't want any gold or they do want gold or they want more silver or they don't want silver, etc. We also, I also edit a, a newsletter that is separate from the money management um, that, that uh, recommends particular stocks. And people can find out about our services by going to adrianday.com. Great. Well, I'll put a link to that in the description below. Thank you once again, Adrian, for coming on and sharing your knowledge with the audience. Well, I appreciate it very much, Jesse, and thank you for having me. I hope I wasn't too, too long-winded. And thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by ARC Silver Gold Osmium. Contact owner Ian Everard today for all of your precious metals needs at 307-264-9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com. Visit their website at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And I'll see you guys on the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.